This morning we are grateful to God again that we can be online with the brethren of the Central Brooklyn Church of Christ as we study again regarding version two of a series of lessons on the church where we have added some lessons and rearranged some material and we are trying to teach what we believe the Word of God brings forth regarding uh, the church. And today, Lesson 5, Part 1 of 2, will be the only source of divine authority today. And as you look at the list, as we see the list uh, that will be on screen for those who will uh, watch or listen to these lessons later, we began this series by looking at what is the church. The church is Jesus' assembly of people that he saves. That is the church. It is not an institution, a building, or a denomination. Uh, it is a, the, simply the assembly of people that Jesus saves. The nature of the universal church, that total number of people that Jesus saves in the world, that's what we looked in Lesson 2. Then we looked at the nature of a local church where saints in a particular location meet and worship and work together as a local church. And last two Sundays, we looked at unreliable sources of religious authority, which we'll summarize in just a moment. Today, the only source of divine authority we will focus on, that is the Apostles' teaching. Uh, later, how to establish divine authority, things that are expedient, and then respecting the silence of the Scriptures. All of those lessons relating to uh, how to understand the authority of the Lord Jesus. If we don't understand how he expresses his authority in the New Testament, we're going to misapply it. And then how it applies to the organization and to the work of a local church and how local churches are to cooperate together. Two errors that continue to plague uh, even the churches of Christ, institutionalism and the social gospel. And then finally, the unity of the church which we have not preached in these series of lessons before, but the Lord willing, we look forward to doing so uh, at the end of this series in a few months. So again, we are thankful for the strength the Lord provides, and we hope and we trust and pray that we can communicate clearly and that you will search the scriptures to see if the things that we teach are so that your faith may be in God rather than in men. We looked last two Sundays, what is authority and why do we need it? Authority is the power or right to command, and only Jesus has been given this authority by his heavenly Father over heaven and earth. Uh, unreliable sources of authority for the work and worship of the church uh, today include the Old Testament, which Jesus has nailed to the cross and has established a new covenant in the apostles' teaching, which is our authority for how we live and how we worship and work together as local churches today. Majority rule, uh, family, preachers and other religious leaders like elders, good results, whether something does a lot of good or not, written and unwritten traditions of men, our conscience, feelings, and human wisdom, all are unreliable sources of, human author of, of religious authority. They cannot be depended on to lead us into submission to Christ, but only into rebellion against the Lord Jesus whom we claim to serve. And so we must reject all of these things, and when we reject them, then, reject them, then we have to ask the question, what is the source of divine authority today? Sadly, many follow these unreliable sources of religious authority that have provided many church that have 
produced many churches that often teach conflicting things and practice conflicting things. To be unified with God and to be unified with one another, we must submit to the only true source of divine authority today, that is the apostles' teaching the New Testament. And we want to confirm that uh, this Sunday and especially next by the Scriptures. Jesus has been given all authority from his Father to save, to be Lord of all, ruler of the nations, head of his one church, and high priest uh, before God. And so Jesus has been placed in that position, given all authority by his Father over heaven and earth, including how to communicate that authority to his church uh, in the New Testament, and that will be the only point, uh, but a most important point that we have in our lesson today, how Jesus has all authority uh, given to him by the Father. Although he spoke truth directly to his apostles while he was on the earth, he promised that they would be guided into all truth by the Holy Spirit. And he promised the apostles. He did not promise us. And that's where so many seemingly sincere people have fallen into the trap of being guided by their own feelings of what they think God said to them, what they think God showed them a vision, what they think God gave them a prophecy, uh, what they think God gave them a word of knowledge, uh, they have become what they think God gave them a correct interpretation of Scripture. Uh, they have been so misguided because they believe that somehow the Holy Spirit is supposed to speak directly to them today. That is a fallacy, a deadly fallacy. He speaks indirectly to us by the apostles' teaching. And he spoke directly to them and other inspired men that wrote and confirmed the New Testament by miracle that we can have it, that we can trust in it, and that we can follow it. After his ascension into heaven, the Holy Spirit revealed and confirmed to them the complete truth which they spoke and wrote for us today. That's why we reject those who say they have a new truth, a a continuing revelation of God, uh, continuing miracles from God. We reject all of that because it, it, it shows us the insufficiency of the New Testament, that it's not enough what God has already done. They have to be involved in it by revelations and prophecies and miracles. They have a part in it. Well, what good did God do? By writing the New Testament, if you're gonna, you have been told something by God today uh, that is necessary for us to know, then I guess God failed to communicate his complete word. This is the whole problem. We'll get to more on that next week. But to the main point of our lesson, one point we will drive home so that we don't mistake it or overlook it or de-emphasize it. The Father has given Jesus all authority. John 10 and verse 17, Jesus spoke and he said, For this reason, the Father loves me because I lay down my life so that I may take it again. No one has taken it away from me, but I lay it down on my own initiative. I have authority to lay it down, and I have authority to take it up again. This commandment I received from my Father. So Jesus said, I, ha I have been given authority to, to die for the sins of the world and to be resurrected from the dead after providing the perfect sacrifice for humanity. The night before, uh, he spoke to his he. Uh, died, he spoke to his disciples during the uh, memorial supper, which he inaugurated uh, before his death, or 
gave them an opportunity to see what that would be. That should be practice after he had gone into heaven. Matthew 26 and verse 28, he said, For this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for forgiveness of sins. That is the basis for God forgiving the penitent sinner who obeys the gospel and is after confessing Jesus as the Son of God, is baptized, immersed in water, baptized into the death of Jesus to be raised up again into newness of life, forgiven of all past sins. That is the basis for a just God to still be just, punishing sins in the death of Jesus, and still be merciful, providing a way of pardon for the sinner. In verse 32, Jesus goes on in Matthew 26, But after I have been raised, I will go ahead of you into go ahead of you to Galilee. And so Jesus made it clear that he would die for the sins of the world and he would be raised from the dead the third day and appear before his apostles on numerous occasions as well as others. Before, after 40 days, he would ascend back to heaven where he is now ruling at the right hand of God, having all the authority over heaven and earth that the Lord, that, that God the Father had promised him, that the Old Testament had prophesied that he would have. Matthew 28 and verse 18, before he ascended back to heaven, speaking to his apostles, and, he, and Jesus came up and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them, immersing them in water, in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit teaching them to observe all that I commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. So Jesus says, make disciples. I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. And on the day of Pentecost, ten days after he ascended into heaven in Jerusalem, on that grand day of Pentecost, the first day of the week, Sunday, the twelve apostles that Jesus had chosen as witnesses of his ministry, uh, even through his ascension to heaven, he had chosen those men and told them the Holy Spirit would come and guide them into the truth of who Jesus is, what he had done for humanity to be saved, and what we must do to be saved, and how we must live as Christians, including working and worshiping with the local church, all of this would be revealed to them, brought forth by the authority from, that God gave to Jesus, fulfilling the promise that David had indicated that he would be both king and priest, high priest before God, fulfilled in his death, resurrection, ascension to heaven, and God giving him all authority over heaven and earth. That's what Acts chapter 2 and verse... Uh, the, Acts chapter 2 is all about. They spoke in miraculous tongues where the people from other parts of the Roman Empire, the Jews that had acquired other languages in those places, could hear and understand in those languages that the apostles had never learned but the Spirit guided them into speaking not only the words that they were given, but the language in which the words should be spoken, seeing that was a miracle from God because they were untrained in these languages. They were untrained on their own in what the truth about Jesus was. And now they are speaking this truth in these foreign languages by miracle. And this is what they said in part. Acts 2 and verse 22. Men of Israel, listen to these words. Why? Because they're authoritative from Jesus. 
Jesus the Nazarene, a man attested to you by God with miracles and wonders and signs, which God performed through him in your midst, just as you yourselves know. This man delivered over by the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God, you nailed to a cross by the hands of godless men and put him to death. That is, you oppose God and you put Jesus to death, but he, although he had performed many miracles that you could not deny. Verse 24, But God raised him from up again, putting an end to the agony of death, since it was impossible for him to be held in its power. God overcame your opposition, as God always does, sooner or later. And he raised Jesus from the dead the third day and has now seated him at his right hand in heaven. It was impossible for death to have power over him. Why? Because David in the 16th Psalm, David in the 16th Psalm beginning in verse 8 foretold that Jesus would die and be raised from the dead. Acts 2.29, Brethren, I may confidently say to you regarding the patriarch David that he both died and was buried and his tomb is with us to this day. David's body has decayed. And so because he was a prophet and knew that God had sworn to him with an oath to seat one of his descendants, on his throne, that's in the 132nd Psalm, among other places, he looked ahead and spoke of the resurrection of the Christ, that he was neither abandoned, this is quoting the 16th Psalm again, that he was neither abandoned to Hades, that is the unseen world of the dead, nor did his flesh suffer decay. So physically and spiritually Jesus would not be abandoned, he would be raised from the dead before his body could ever decay. And that's what happened on the third day. But now Jesus has not only been raised from the dead, it was foretold that he would be appointed king in the line of David, not in, on, in Jerusalem, but at the right hand of God in heaven. That was the true throne that David's throne was a symbol of. Acts 2 and verse 32, this Jesus, God raised up again to which we are all witnesses. Therefore, having been exalted to the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, that's the promise to seat one of David's descendants on his throne that he made to David, he has poured forth this which you both see and hear. In other words, us speaking these things in languages that we had not learned, that you know very well, this is God's proof that Jesus is reigning in heaven. For it was not David who ascended into heaven, but he himself says, The Lord said to my Lord in the 110th Psalm, Set at my right hand. Until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Therefore let all the house of Israel know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, both Lord and King, anointed one. This Jesus whom you crucified, does that not tell us that Jesus has been given all authority in heaven and earth, that authority he has even now? at the right hand of God, Lord of the nations, sustainer of the universe, head of his one church, king of the nations, and high priest between the saints and God. Jesus has been given all authority. Now when they heard this, they were pierced to the heart and said to Peter 
And the rest of the apostles, brethren, what shall we do? They had opposed God's authority. When we want to live our own sinful lives uh, in opposition to the word of God, we are opposing God's authority also. We are trying to make ourselves or Satan the God of our lives, and we reject the divine authority that has been given to Jesus. They had done that. And they had agreed to and endorsed the, and in some cases brought about the crucifixion of Jesus. They said, what shall we do? Peter said to them, pray the sinner's prayer. Is that what he said? Absolutely not. And whoever tells us that is lying. Whether they're doing it intentionally or not, it is a lie to say that the person can become saved by the sinner's prayer. It is an out and out satanic lie. It is not in the word of God. But what is in the word of God after believing in Jesus, which they did, they still needed to do something to be saved. Peter said, now that you believe, repent, change your mind about your sins and each of you be baptized, immersed, buried in water, in the name, by the authority of Jesus Christ, in order to, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, the promise of salvation, and all blessings of heirs uh, to eternal life we will receive. And the point is that those are God's conditions along with, as we read in Acts 8, beginning in verse 26 and forward, 25 and forward about the Ethiopian eunuch. As we read that, he confessed Jesus as the Son of God before he was baptized for the forgiveness of his sins. So when we look at everything, the person who believes in Jesus enough to repent of their sins, confess him as the Son of God, that he is God along with the Father and the Holy Spirit, and be immersed in water for the forgiveness of sins, is forgiven by God by the blood of Jesus, and can go forward by God's grace to begin to live by the apostles' teaching. Verse 41, So then those who had received his word were baptized, and that day there were added about 3,000 souls. Nothing about the sinner's prayer here. Verse 42, they were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching, not the law of Moses, and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. Instead of people depending on the apostles' teaching, they followed disciplines and concordances and writings of men. Maybe they don't even recognize they're following those things in these denominations, but they are because that's what the leaders are trained in and told to teach and teach. And uh, that is not the apostles' teaching. We don't need the writings of men because if they don't tell us any more than what the apostles tell us, then we don't need them. If they tell us more than what the apostles tell us, we still don't need them. If they tell us less than what the apostles tell us, we still don't need them because we have exactly what the apostles tell us in the New Testament. Verse 47 of Acts 2, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord was adding to their number day by day those who were being saved. Jesus has been given authority over heaven and earth. Ephesians 1 and verse 20, which he brought about in Christ this power when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and every name that is named, not only in the, this age but also in the one to come. And he put all things in subjection under his feet and gave him as head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all and all. 
Jesus, the only head of his one church, the only one through whom is to communicate that authority through his apostles and inspired men of the New Testament. Ephesians 5 and verse 23, For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ also is the head of the church, he himself being the Savior of the body. What does the head of the body do? It directs all the members of the body. But as the church is subject to Christ, so also the wives ought to be to their husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her so that he might sanctify her having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word that he might present to himself the church in all her glory having no spot or wrinkle or any such thing but that she would be holy and blameless. So that is the submissive, holy church that is to respect and follow only the authority of Christ. In Hebrews 1 and verse 1, God, after he spoke long ago to the fathers and the prophets, in many portions and in many ways, in these last days has spoken to us in the Pope, in the Mormon leaders, in the Jehovah's Witness Watchtower the Seventh-day Adventist leaders, the Baptist leaders. No, he's spoken to us in his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the world. Jesus said in John 14 and verse 6, the night before he died for our sins, he said, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. And we must come to the Father, as we read in John 6, by following the teaching that is given and placing our faith in the apostles' teaching, uh, foretold by the prophets, confirmed by the fulfilled prophecy in Jesus, and spoken by his apostles and prophets confirmed by miracle in the New Testament. We come to the Father through believing, receiving the gospel, and then obeying. John 6, No one can come to me, Jesus said, unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up on the last day. How does the Father draw us? Through the teaching of his word. It is written in the prophets, and they shall all be taught of God, or some say taught by God. Everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. And so we are drawn when our hearts seek out the Father's teaching in the gospel, which Jesus authorized also by sending the Holy Spirit to his apostles to speak it and confirm it, which we will confirm by Scripture that that is the case next Sunday, the Lord willing. What have we learned today? That the only source of divine authority today, just this one point as we close the lesson, but a fundamental point, the Father has given Jesus all authority. He still has that authority. The Father has given Jesus all authority. And now we must learn and follow only that authority in the New Testament. Won't you respond to the gospel today? That would be our plea to you. In spite of all opposition, which is growing greater day by day, it seems, those who think they can defy God have defied God. Political leaders, religious leaders, education leaders, social and mass media leaders, so many believe they can defile God's word and follow their own way and impose their godless will upon even his people. 
And we see that not only here in the U.S., but across the world. As the devil's playground is continuing to be open and to trying to bring forth what appears to be world power under satanic rule for the greed of a few at the expense of many. And Jesus knows all of it even more perfectly than we do and is ruling at the right hand of God. And he judges the nations as he will judge whatever nation is in opposition and then he will judge those nations that he judges, uh, that, use, that he uses to judge others. So Jesus is in control, but even as we are suffering, uh, oppressed to some degree or another, even more so in, in some other countries as well, why not do something which no power on earth can stop you from doing? That is, obey the gospel of Christ. Submit to the authoritative gospel of Jesus revealed by his apostles and inspired men of the New Testament. If you believe in Jesus as the Son of God, that he died for your sins, is raised from the dead, and is at the right hand of God, ruling over heaven and earth as king and priest, head of his one church, if you believe that, repent of your sins, Turn away from sin to God. Confess your faith that you believe that Jesus is the Son of God before men and immediately, as soon as possible, be immersed in water in the name of Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins and arise by the grace of God out of that water, cleansed by the blood of Jesus through your obedient faith. And there's not a force on earth, no matter how much the opposition, that can prevent us from being forgiven by a gracious and loving God who has opened the way to heaven through the Lord Jesus. Continue after becoming a Christian to seek out the apostles' teaching, meeting with those as soon as possible, who work and worship together only as Christians who seek to follow the apostles' teaching, saved in the way that he says we should be saved, seeking to follow only the apostles' teaching. And then, as Christians, when we fall back into sin, let us repent and pray that the blood of Jesus may cleanse us, that we might continue to walk by his grace and grow stronger in faith. Looking forward always to eternal life, Jesus, our only hope. If anyone is here and subject to the gospel, that grand, gracious invitation, we would encourage all to respond. Won't you come now as we draw the lesson to a close?